Hello and welcome to Nerdarchy. For Nerds by Nerds, I'm Nerdarchist Dave. And I'm Nerdarchist Ted. So our, our first topic uh, we're going to talk today is about the D&D Retreat. All right, Ted, so today we're talking about the D&D Retreat. All right, so, you know, as we mentioned, today we're going to be talking about D&D Retreats. And, you know, the reason we're talking about it is because you and I went on one. Indeed. And we got to play with a bunch of different people. I think there was like 16 of us involved, a uh, bunch of different systems. And we're kind of going to discuss like pros and cons of doing this type of thing. It's not even the first time I've heard of it. Like, um, some of you might be aware that we do a thing called d and in a Castle, and we have one coming up uh, in the near future. Indeed. Well, d and in a Castle started because one of the co-founders, Cameron, would get together with, like, all of his, like, old buddies that he grew up with, you know, one time a year, and rent a cabin or an Airbnb or something, and be like... We're just going to play D&D for like three days straight. We're not going to bathe. We're not going to shower. Feed ourselves properly. We're just going to live, breathe, gaming, right? And then, you know, he had this epiphany like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this, but like in a castle? And Tara, his sister, was actually involved in these uh, Jane Austen events. So, so, so she was used to renting out like these plantations, these mansions, and having you know having day events or weekend events. I don't know really sure, but she had she had some some skills there and some experience. Cameron goes, "Hey, you've done this thing. What if we did that, but with D and D and a castle?" So they kind of did like a uh, a maiden voyage, uh, the prototype in France. Some would say it wasn't actually can castle but a lord's manor i imagine they pushed their glasses up on the rim in her nose and high you could them. totally be like you know with our powers combined yeah they did that right <laughs> so but like you don't have to do it in a castle it doesn't have to be like a high-end thing the, the the point is right for for us and um and i, I think this group we're probably going to do it with on an annual basis mm-hmm. now is getting together and taking the, the part of the convention where you go to play games and and just focusing on that and getting rid of everything else you don't have the awful carpeting uh you don't have a room full of tables where everyone is on top of each <laughs> other <laughs> and like you're like you start role playing but with someone else from another table because they're really loud and then like it just bleeds into your table you know so so that's what we did and it was really fantastic and and really anybody can do it. You know, the the core elements is to number one, it's a getaway. So you you don't want to be like, oh, let's just go over to Bob's basement and we'll all just crash there for the weekend. Uh, it's you go to another location similar to like you do at a con or what have you. And here you're gonna get the opportunity to just be like, all right, we're gonna set up this schedule. We're gonna do this thing, and you can do it as like you know, run it like a drill sergeant. And it is eight o'clock. Why aren't why isn't breakfast on the table? It's nine o'clock. Why aren't we gaming? Where you could totally have it be like, no, nah, we're mellow out we're just gonna have fun spend time with friends and roll dice and you know anywhere in between that that is gonna best fit your collection of people that are get together you know we we did this with 16 people four different tables it was absolutely amazing and i can't wait to do it again yeah so we can go over kind of like um what our structure was what our structure was and how we did the games but it doesn't mean you have to do the games that way and you have to follow this structure you can figure out what works for you and implement that you know with your friends 100 percent. so we had 16 people that easily divides four groups of four and we decided we were going to do something a little bit crazy a little bit wonky. So we had four sessions. We had a session zero and three actual play sessions. And, you know, the person who set this all up divided each into groups of four that didn't stay together. So you moved tables throughout. But session zero, you got together and you figured out what was the major plot for this location? Where were you located? And how was it going to affect your story to the other tables that were there? Because we were all essentially on the same place and there was a global problem. And that if one table managed to fail, the world was going to be destroyed. And therefore each table had to be successful. So we had like a Dark Sun-esque place that we called Dim Sun. We had the Underdark, you know, we had a political table and we had an island table that was like kind of like in a in a cold region. And you know, once you set up and made your characters and made your central plot, you know, you could then talk to other players and or other tables and see how the how things were done. Like we sent emissaries 
to go have have brief conversations. Then once everyone's session zeros were done, you would move on to your session one, where you would change table and you would pick up one of the characters that were there and you would just play. And then in between each session, the DMs would talk to each other so that you could transfer notes. So like, all right, well, you were playing this, this story with this system, with these characters. Here's where you left off. Here's where the end goal is. So good luck with that, have fun. And you then had to make sense of it to then run your story and then move on. And it was so much fun, so much chaos. And like I said, just can't wait to do it again. So that that was the structure. Mm-hmm. And you can go with like something similar to that, or you can do whatever you want. But actually, we say D and D retreat, but there was very little D and D played. You, I think, the closest to D and D that got played was what I read. What you ran, like you ran a dumbed down version of Five E, but there was also Deathbringer, which is very Five E like, and uh, and also Shadow Dark was run, which is very D and D like. But like that was as close as we got to D and D. When when all of this was set up, you know, it was like, oh, let's go play a whole bunch of D and D. So I came prepped mentally for let's do D and D. If I would have thought like, oh, well, this is the the format before I got there, then I would have been like, all right, well, let's grab a couple other rules like kind of things that I could bring that I could easily have this kind of stuff set up for but i didn't so i'm like all right i'm doing DD. so then when i sat down at my table and saw the characters that were prepped some of the things like because they didn't have like ready-made character sheets it was just conceptually what here's what things are so i had to try and like pigeonhole these odd characters into my you know dim sun or dark sun world and i'm like all right this is going to be a challenge so i don't think i can run like a full 5e i'm just going to be like all right let's pare this down i got rid of like anything that was kind of like class stuff but like look we're gonna play with the proficiency modifier your stats and if something makes sense you know we'll we'll just kind of run with it i don't want to take the time to have to like pull out DD beyond or a player's handbook to figure out exactly you know what is the nuts and bolts of your characters and everybody had fun with this you know streamlined version of it yeah you ran that um another player just made something up mm -hmm. on the spot uh we said deathbringer um shadow dark you ran zoo mafia modified i have Heavily ran a modified Zoo Mafia to make it a fantasy game. Uh, there was or Easy D6. Easy so, D6. Uh, there was IC RPG. Mm -hmm. I got to play that one. And uh, Karen, Karen was the other one. So there was a ton of games played, and it's funny. But what we've discovered is a lot of people in this particular group they just use D and D as a stand-in for RPGs basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is it has become synonymous, so like a lot of times the term RPG and D&D &D are so synonymous that they just kind of correlate one to the other. So it's a it's a situation where it's like, all right, is it really that big a deal? Is it that much of a problem? So uh, while I was prepared for D&D, &D, to me, the rule set doesn't necessarily matter as much. And as I said in the beginning, I enjoy learning new systems. So sitting down to play something new every time has its own love and joy. What is great about trying out new games and new systems? Trying out a new game system lets you do a number of things. Number one, it has the ability to let you find out what kind of things, what kind of rule sets might you want to add into you know your regular game? Because there's lots of things where a small component of a rule set fits so well that you could just lift it up and put it in another in another game. But it also tells you kind of things that you might not enjoy about a, a, a game system. So there's some that are like super crunchy. There's some that are very rules light, and your play style might fit better in one than in another. All right, so that's how it went, yo, for our D and D retreat, right? Mm -hmm. But let's talk about let's talk about generic. Like let's talk about how it could help you and what you can do with it in your own games and your own your own D and D TTRPG retreat, whatever you want to call it, really, right? Mm -hmm. Your getaway. So what are our takeaways that are kind of like non-specific? So as much as it's kind of like an unspoken situation, I really do feel the the camaraderie and the food that typically goes with an RPG session. It needs to be there. So while you were like, oh, you know, we're gonna play D and D and we're not gonna eat, like. To me, that's like horrifying. I'm like, nah, man, you need your meals, you need your snacks, uh, because there's 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 the deal. And I know that with some of the games that I run, like I know that I'm doing my job when my players are stress eating. And as much as I do care about my players, you know, and friends' health, uh, to me that that lets me know something. 
So like, I really feel that, okay, there should be a part of your scheduling that does take food into account. Yeah, so obviously, like, you have to take care of basic needs. You know, that was be me being hyperbolic, right? <laughs> but that being said, like, you know, you know, some kind of structure does make it a little bit easier. So I would recommend that, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe some of the people, like in our case that were invited, weren't people that we really knew at all or were just acquaintances. So you get to build stronger ties, stronger bonds. So when you have the downtime where you're not actually playing the games, like you said, at meal times, or we kind of left like later evenings open to just kind of hang out and enjoy that the ambience of uh, the place that we had rented out. Yep. You know, we rented out this huge like cabin. But, like there were 16 of us, so it wasn't like too bad <laughs> for everyone. And everyone pitched in for different meals and stuff like that. So, you know, all of that is kind of super useful. And then also on top of that, you're just unplugging from the world. So, you know, so that, you know, you don't have outside distractions. No one's like, oh, I got to leave because, you know, I got work in the morning morning or I get home it's like nah we're you're there for several days like we did a Thursday through Sunday almost like a convention um and you can schedule it and you can be like have different games and be like who wants to run what who wants to play in what and you can do kind of round robin DMs like you can almost do like sign up sheets be like okay so and so is going to run this at this time and it, it doesn't have to be like a huge thing where we had 16 people which is a lot of people you can even do it with your your regular uh D&D &D or TTRBG group and be like hey let's do this it'll be a fun thing it'll be a getaway and you know maybe you've even planned some activities that aren't game related right maybe you guys decide to do a escape room together or, or you know have a movie night or something you know it's just a way, a way to further bond with people that you're either friends with or acquaintances with or maybe you'd like to be so what is the advantage of gaming with new players all right so uh gaming with new players allows you to experience different play styles um and also just like you know, to me and to, i think to you as well anytime we invite someone when new to our, our table it's always been an invitation to not just play games with us to, but, but to be our friends so you know playing with new players is is a chance to make new friends yeah i highly recommend that if you're going to do something like this you know it, it does get planned so you th you figure out and talk beforehand of all right are we starting a new campaign or a new thing just for this location uh or, or is it something that's kind of a continuing story and you're just gonna have like one massive weekend where like you're gonna make a major push you know is one person planning to dm for the whole thing you know D, &D you know in a castle style or is it going to be as dave suggested a round robin where like the dm rotates and you know a player kind of like falls off or just kind of like fades into the background or you do you one know, shots right they're all all one shots or, or something or it's all one shots where nothing is connected there's lots of different styles that you can do we don't necessarily know what your group prefers how you play and what you would want to do at such a thing uh so any of this all of this is entirely possible and i highly recommend that you know you give this a try because it was a blast it was a good time so dave did you have uh like any awesome moments at at your table that you think would be you know kind of cool to share here if you don't know zoom mafia is a game that nurk he's working on and maybe i'm a little biased on this one but part of what we do with zoo mafia there's like a luck benny that you can use but if you run out of it then your character is going to be removed from the game you know maybe they die maybe they just get sent away in this case i had two characters marker out in order to accomplish the goals for the group which in this case since it was a one shot it just led to both of their demises right but it was both of which were very spectacular and they were able to you know kind of like save the world via their sacrifices one of the characters kind of got to make up for a big mistake that they made. Um, matter of fact, you made the mistake, sort of, uh, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Uh, when you played that particular character, right. um, you know, like, you know, it was a political game and you outmaneuvered some of your uh, political rivals and yes. foes, which happened to be in your same group. <laughs> but in doing so, so you actually sided with kind of the dark forces inadvertently. There's no kind of. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, and I'll explain my side of the story when once they was done with his but yeah i absolutely allowed the darker forces to have more power in the in the world oops yeah so the the, the climatic um scene was essentially you know a demon coming through this portal and they had to close the portal and send the demon back right and that demon was you know, summoned by the queen. You decide to side with the queen. The queen actually thought she was working towards closing the portal, but... She was being manipulated. She was being manipulated, and lo and behold, surprise, the demon lied to her. <gasps> <laughs> Who would have thought? 
Uh, and, you know, so Maximus, the character, in the end, was able to create a distraction. And he used one of his markers to go, hey, I actually had a secret contingent of my army set up and ready to go. Which basically was able to draw the demon long away long enough for one of the other ta characters to start working on the ritual to send the demon back and close the portal. But it, did, it wasn't quite good enough to send all the other demons away. And there were some that were still there when the other characters were like, well, I want to hold them off while the ritual is completed. And... They use their markers to make that happen. So both characters end up dying spectacularly at the hands, or should I say, claws of uh, <laughs> demons. So in the game prior to Dave's Zoo Mafia, uh, we had a, a political game. We, we had, a, we had a, a system that was made up entirely on the spot. Every character had a reputation score and there was a modifier that went along with it. None of Nothing else mattered in this game because it was all, all about political maneuvering. Now, as Ted, I am a cooperative player. I am not a big fan of PvP and I kind of said this at like at the beginning of, of the session. And so we were given an index card that had our character information, our motives, our secret goals, and then we were given a secret that we were trying to hide, uh, which allowed us to have other things going on. Well, based off of my character's motivations, like I'm like, all right, well, here's what I need to do. Here's my objectives. Uh, and that in some ways kind of conflicted with some of the other players. Since we didn't have information as to whether like the king or the queen were in the right, I sided with the queen. Well, as things kind of got clearly between the players that, well, we're on different sides here, you know, they wound up having a private conversation. I was like, okay, well, I'll just step away from the table for a moment. And they wound up, you know, quickly discussing this secret plot to basically sabotage me. And I fully expected bad things were going to happen and whatever have you, and it's a one-shot for me. It's no big deal what happens in this story. Uh, but I'm still going to play my character based off of what's on my sheet. So we come in front of the king, and they begin to, like, offer these political machinations. And because it's all about reputation, anytime there was a roll-off, I wound up winning, which wound up decreasing their reputation, increasing mine, because all of this is happening right in front of the king. So very quickly, like, I outmaneuvered both of them based off of, you know, my good roles and my secret thing that I couldn't let get shared. So because of all of that, the, se the session ends with me giving this MacGuffin to the queen, which brings about the bad things in the next session, and I have both of the other characters arrested. And I'm sitting high and mighty with like, all right, well, all of the things that I want to have happen are now in motion, even though all of them are bad. <laughs> I've won. Oh, what is my prize? The world is about to end. Run over, run by demons. So while for the session, like I got to leave like, okay, I, I won this game. I feel, I feel great. Yeah. Hearing the story from, you know, the other side is like, wow, my character is an absolute jackass. <laughs> <laughs> But you know when it's when it comes to be a story and knowing that like Dave's they ran the finale for that particular table and knowing that you know my character did die and you know wound up doing something to get a redemption arc slightly <laughs> redeem themselves yeah, yeah. I'm like all right well that wasn't that yeah. wasn't my running, but it happened. The next player that came in got the uh, the people that you got jailed freed after they realized how bad things have gotten mm -hmm. and, and where they screwed up. And they began working to try and help fix the problem and ultimately paid the ultimate price for it. But they saved the world. Uh, their head was ripped off. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, but you know, so like that was that was just you know one of the tables that happened you know at at this little gathering, and you know it was a it was a blast to have these these moments, um, you know. So it's 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 a lot of fun to uh, you know to kind of do that. a lot of the topics from here on out are going to be based on uh, the games that were played at that particular event, and also we're gonna kind of do like a lot of this most of this podcast or all of this podcast is really doesn't have anything to do with D D and D. It's about these other TTG RPGs we sometimes play. All right, so we're gonna get into our next topic. I know this might be a bit of a shock to some of you folks out there, but yes, Nerdarchy does play other TT RPGs other than D and D. So today we're gonna talk about Cairn. And you can check out this video 
Radio. Nerdarchy plays other TTRPGs? All right, so Dave, big question. What is Cairn? Cairn is another role-playing game. It's very rules light. Great for survivalist type games. It's a D20 roll under. There's only three stats, but there is so much more to Cairn. Folks should go find it and check it out. So we have we have Cairn here, and as you can kind of loosely see, it's a, it's a small little book here. Uh, it's only 18 pages, and it's written by Yokai Gal. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun from what I hear, Dave. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? All right, so I guess we'll talk we'll talk about the game we played, but first let's just go run through the numbers. It uses your standard polyhedral dice. So if you've already playing D&D &D and using those dice, you already have the dice you need. I guess one of the big things that makes Karen really easy is there's only three stats. Strength, dex, and will. You're going to roll three die six, and you're going to come up with those stats. And, and whenever you need to use one of those stats, you roll a d20, and you need to get under that number. That seems pretty straightforward. So it takes a bit of getting used to if you're used to playing like traditional d20 games i know that there was a story where uh your wife my sister went up playing and she rolled a natural one she's like oh i guess i failed and they're like nah that you you won you did it <laughs> yeah you literally won and won <laughs> oh brother this guy stinks uh so there's some other fun facts about this game uh there is deprived fatigue and those tied to like your equipment slots because you have equipment slots in this game uh you also have hit protection and armor in this game i've run through some of those real quick uh so hit protection is basically it's kind of it's kind of like your it's not like really your hit points and i kept like referring to it as my hp but what happens is in cairn you don't make attack rolls you just take damage and you would use your hit protection to see how much of the damage you soak so if you have a protection of three if you take you know three or less you take no damage armor is one of the things that adds to your hit protection i think there might be some other things that could give it to you as well but what happens is once you run out of hit protection you become deprived and you then you start going into your stats and your stats get lower which makes it harder for you to do things it's much harder to heal from you know that stat damage you know water and food in the game restores your hip protection much longer to restore your stats now why this is important you know uh, fatigue is represented in your equipment slots you only have so many but once you gain a level of fatigue you have to cross something off of your equipment right and this becomes really bad because of your equipment things you have to keep is food and water and food and water are things that restore you from after you're getting fatigued and keep you from getting fatigued right and keep you out of the deprived state and when you're deprived also you get penalties to your roles so it becomes this really bad cycle and loop so really you want to avoid conflict in this game as best as possible because if you don't you know you, you you can go into the death spiral so that's going to be like a really cool for a very specific type of gameplay when i've used the karen system we were playing uh in a world called dim sun which is loosely based off dark sun um so very survivalistic those equipment slots, you know, really can majorly impact the gameplay because if you get rid of the wrong thing, like your armor, which will lower your hip protection, or your water, you know, therefore you're going to not be able to, you know, keep hydrated and, and keep your health up. Uh, so that can seriously, you know, ma make for a major, major problem in the game. So another thing in the game is called impaired and enhanced. And basically I can step the die up and down um, that you're using. Uh, there is also like an advantage mechanic. So like if you're fighting with two weapons, it doesn't mean you damage twice. You just roll your damage twice and take the better of the two. So it's got nifty little things like that. There aren't spellcasters per se there isn't character classes per se it's basically just how you built your character you know spellcasters use uh I think they call them spell books and each spell book is like a spell and the more of these that you have the more spells that you can cast right so anybody can cast spells you just need spell books all right so what would you say Cairn does really well it is an awesome survivalist game right I kind of mentioned that earlier mm -hmm. but like if you want to get that feel where you know you're trying to survive whether it's a zombie apocalypse or you know you're, you're in the desert or the wilderness and you have limited resources one of the things you're trying to do and would come up in Cairn is like oh you did a thing now you got a bunch of water everyone gets to stock up on water and then now all of a sudden players are getting excited because they have these cactus pods full of water like i've seen players in dnd &D get really super excited about finding gold and magic items same level of excitement because it's the water and the food and this game that keeps you alive so that you can try and succeed and get things done so you mentioned you know whether it's zombie apocalypse or you know uh, a fantasy does it does it cross uh, genres 
happen. To... I would say it's real easy to change it because it's very rules light. It's very simple. There's not a whole lot in there. You, you would just like reflavor some of the weapons and stuff like that. Say like if you wanted to do science fiction or something along those lines. Um, I, I feel like this game has a lot of flexibility. Uh, it's not very like rules nitty gritty, so it's not going to be good for doing that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. it is a fun, easy way to kind of simulate survival style games without being like you know super crunchy. That's basically Karen in a nutshell. Uh, definitely, if you want to check it out, you know, go find Karen. I'll put a link down in the description so that you can go find it. It was a lot of fun. If you're looking for a game that you know maybe you know somebody didn't show up for the game your normal game and you just need to run something fast there's tons of you know random roll charts in there that you can use and you, you'd be up and playing within like 10 minutes so we're going to move on to our next topic so today we're going to talk about easy d6 easy d6 is a very easy role-playing game that you can pick up and learn uh, fairly simple and as the name suggests it only uses d6 if you're looking for a rules-like game that can be played in multiple genres but you you know, has a heavy fantasy bent you know as is this game might be worth checking out for you all over on nerdarchy you can find a longer video telling you more about easy d6 so you can always check out the nerdarchy plays other ttrpgs up here because uh yes we do play uh things other than D. &D. there's a whole playlist all right so we know that easy d6 was created by dm scotty scotty mcfarland aka the craft father uh so do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience with this game uh, i do but before we do let's run down like the the basis of the game itself and let people know what to expect if they pick up easy d6 so first of all it is a mere 120 pages so it's it's not huge it's a fairly easy and quick uh, read you only die you really need is a d6 there might be some random roll charts in there and stuff like that that have require some other dice but primarily to play the game you only need a d6 so what about stats dave uh unlike a lot of rpgs this one has zero stats there are none uh that you're gonna have to worry about and the core mechanic of the the game is you have a DC that you're going to roll a D6 against and the, you know you're going to have uh, the difficulties are going to range from uh, easy the moderate to hard and basically like it's a two to five I mean two to six range and basically you have to meet or beat that number on the die so unlike other games uh, this does not have character classes but paths which are similar to character classes and you have the warden warrior and delver we've got brute rascal and friar there is a conjurer beastmaster and scar so quite a selection and you know if you're used to you know uh you know vocab some of these things can easily cross over into concepts that we're already familiar with. yeah i mean they cover a lot of the classic fantasy tropes right because mm -hmm. it was designed to be a fantasy game but uh, you know i know that dm scotty has run it with other things like time traveling terminator teddy bears <laughs> <laughs> So now we're going to get into other fun facts about the game. You have Banes and Boons, right? And basically those species and those paths, these are going to actually give you access to a lot of those boons. And you know, when you have a boon, basically what that does allows you to roll more than 1d6 and take the better of the numbers. Uh, if you have a Bane, it is the opposite of that. So not quite as good. So the better you are something, the more d6s you roll, the better chance you have of succeeding. Uh, next up is the Benny system. That is Karma and Hero Points, right? And anytime you you fail you actually gain karma but you can also use karma in order to increase your roll so like if you roll a four but you needed a five you can spend one karma to increase the number or you can also try to cause a crit like when you get a six is a crit and then that allows you to roll another die uh, which can you know give you better results hero points are one of the few things in the game that actually lets you re-roll a die other than the crits and it's very important for certain things because for instance if you have have, you know, if you don't have any karma, but you have a hero point, you could spend it. If you have five points of karma, you can turn it in for a hero point. Um, also, sometimes you just don't have enough karma in order to get high enough. But another place where it's crucial is when it comes to magic, right? Different creatures will have magic resistance, which means they're going to roll a set number of D6s. And that's going to set the DC, the best number of that, whether it's one or three or whatever. They pick the best number. And now that's your DC as a spellcaster to get your spell off and defeat their magic resistance. Anytime you roll one on magic, 
magic, you automatic, that's automatic failure. But you can always choose to roll one through three D6s. There's no, no other factor other than you get to choose. But the problem is the more D6s you roll, the more chances of getting failures. And the only right way to overcome your failures can do one of two things. You can spend the hero point and that will get rid of it. Or you can take spell burn, right? Oh, this doesn't sound good. So spell burn allows you to re-roll the die and try and succeed, but you're also going to take a wound. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but in this game, you only have three wounds. So, you know, it's one of the you know few hard and fast, I guess, stats that you have. Everyone has three wounds. So you could spell burn out really fast, you know, if you're rolling lots of dice. So that's, a, that's one of the things you have to be wary of. Yeah, so you want to pay attention to that. And, you know, it sounds like it could be, you know, pretty harsh to, you know, get into spell casting, but you have that choice. No, no one's, you know, going to force you to, to say, all right, well, you have to take it. You can be like, all right, I failed. Well, and that's the other thing, too. It's like, and, you know, based on the number you need to would also determine like you know how many dice do I want to try and roll if it's a low number you're like okay well I can try with one die you know but if you need like a five or a six like you might want to be like all right yes. it's for Go all for the mark. marbles here like I'm Go going for, for it <laughs> now that being said also the magic system is very loosey-goosey and you just kind of the the uh the rabble rouser which is the name of the GM in this game just kind of you know will will kind of determine whether you can do it or not like you have kind of like uh disciplines but the, that only kind of generically says like how your magic works. It doesn't actually say what you can do with it. So you're kind of like pitching the rabble rouser on what you want to try and do with your spells. There's there's times that those kind of things you know, exist in other rule sets. So it's not completely alien. But I do I do enjoy that because then if you have a more forgiving rabble rouser, you know you might be able to have you know a little bit more leeway with your powers. Right. And also they might say, okay, you can try this, but they might add a a level of resistance, so give the enemy another die you know to make which could make it harder for you but it all depends on what gets rolled if they roll all ones it doesn't matter indeed so there's only one thing left to discuss and that's inclinations and basically that is just ways to flavor your character it doesn't matter what the path is or the species um but these inclinations they just let you drill down a little bit further on your characters and define them more so would you say it's like closer to like a background or a feat or is there no no real correspondence to a game like dnd I don't think there's really a correspondence, you know, I, you know, because it could be like guild based or like a specific talent, you know, or more generic. All right, well, sounds like you'll have to check it out to know more. So, uh, what would you say Easy D6 does really well? I would say Easy D6 is a great game for getting into it and just playing right away. Like, we played the first iteration of Easy D6 because GM Scotty really just created this game to have an easy game to go to conventions with and, and run different scenarios. And we went and we visited to DM Scotty um, and he ran a game for us and he's like here's an index card write down these three things and, and then throw it away <laughs> yeah right so like there wasn't much to it it's evolved since then there's ways to evolve your character and advance your character I, you know even when we just played the, you know, the kind of like the, the prototype dumbed down version I saw so much room for possibilities with this game absolutely so, you know, mainly it's a game where you can just get into it really fast and start playing. I believe, like, one of the next things DM Scotty's going to do is start, like, uh, looking at other genres to play, you know, to play in with the game. So that's it for Easy D6. If, uh, you know, you like what you're hearing, I, you know, highly recommend you go check it out. Uh, you know, it's a it's a great game, and it's put out by, you know, a friend of ours. So I would love to see some, uh, some attention drawn in that direction. All right, dude, it's time to jump into topic number four. So today we're going to talk about a game game called Index Card RPG. I got a, you know, the, the Master Edition here. Uh, it's, it's a pretty thick, pretty awesome book. Recommend you check it out. Yeah, like that book's like like 400 pages or so, right? But it's, I mean, it's not a standard size book. And that's the Master Edition. Yes. Yeah. But the regular edition is only like 159 pages. Yeah, the other one is like half the size of this one. So, but yeah, you know, this one comes with you know a whole lot of extra stuff. This was available through through the Kickstarter and can still be gotten from Modifius uh, over in England. You got to pay a little bit more for shipping if you happen to be here in the states, but. Uh, well worth it. So Ted, what would you say ICRPG is? ICRPG is a uh, awesome rules light RPG that allows for quick character creation and in-depth role playing through multiple genres. You know, everything from fantasy to sci-fi to Ice Age and everywhere and everyone in between. I've heard Runehammer referred to as a genius when it comes to RPGs. All right, so as Dave kind of pointed out, you know, this is made by, by Runehammer. You might know him from the YouTubes and interwebs 
and what have you, published by Modifius, uh, and it's available in two iterations, either the regular version that Dave kind of talked about, or, you know, this one here, the Master Edition, which comes with a whole lot more, you know, jam-packed into watch the book. Now, I haven't actually gotten a chance to play this game yet, but I do know it only uses the standard uh, polyhedral set. Indeed, and as the name implies with, you know, index card RPG, your character sheet fits on a single index card. Everything you need can be put on here, including your easy to remember stats. You might recognize some of these, if not all of them. Your stats are strength, dex, con, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. You have a hit point, you have armor class. All of this sounds so streamlined. Uh, now, do you use, like, stats in D&D, like, you know, 3 through 18? Now, with this one, it's it's pretty pretty easy to, to deal with. You're going to use your standard polyhedrals. You're still rolling a D20 to try and be successful, uh, but you're going to be associated with those particular stats. So when you're creating your character, you have six plus ones to distribute however you see fit. Oh, you want to be, like, major buff and put it all into strength, and you're just going to tear through everything. Great, totally doable, have fun with it. You can do, as I saw, you know, one of the other players when I played they just like look I want to have the ability to do everything I'm just dropping plus one down the line and therefore everything is slightly easier for me I was playing a roguelike character so I put a plus three in dex I put a plus one in intelligence and wisdom and because I you know was playing a dwarf I wanted to be hardier I put a plus one in constitution that one didn't really help me out but uh you know it is what it is it felt right it felt right <laughs> Your basic, you know, things like your unarmed attacks and that kind of stuff are going to do a D4. Yeah, if you're going to attack with a weapon, it does a D6. If you're going to attack using magic, it does a D10. And if you've done something to cause an ultimate attack, like a crit or something, you're going to roll a D12. Those are your damages. It all fits right on, you know, this little section of your index card. So, Ted, can you tell us about the core mechanics of ICRPG? So with this one, it's very easy and it's one of the things that makes me really love this particular game is you have a target, you have a DC, you have a number that is assigned at the start of every session. So for our particular game, our target number was 12. Any task that you were doing, if nothing was told to you otherwise, you had to hit that 12, which meant for my character, if I was doing something dex related, because I had that plus three, I needed a nine or better on my D20 roll. And I knew as soon as that die stopped moving, whether I was going to be successful or not. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because, number one, that target number can change from session to session, campaign to campaign, depending upon what the DM feels is most fitting for the particular story. But more so than that, you also have an easy task and a hard task. So, very simple, you have your target number. If something is easy, just subtract three. All right, for that, you know, that game that we played, your easy task would be having to hit a nine, but that hard task is going to have to hit a 15. And you know when you're doing something in life, whether this is something that, oh, I got this, you know things are easy. In real life, you know, oh man, this is going to be difficult. So it does really fit well with a mechanic and it does make knowing success or failure right away and not having to wait for DM confirmation every single time that you roll. Now, yeah, D&D &D has this, you know, ever flowing, ever changing thing that is a beauty of its own. But for a, a rules light game, for a game that you want to just be able to kind of like go through and enjoy the gameplay without having to figure out for every single roll what you have to do. And man, I, I, I felt that added a lev level of enjoyment that I hadn't really experienced before. Yeah, so there's a certain amount of eloquence to this, right? Because you can tell technically work this right into your narrative, right? Oh, you know, you're a dwarf who happens to be a rogue. Uh, the lock you're looking at looks fairly simple to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, and the GM could just code it into the language, right? Absolutely. Oh, that standard 12 is a nine or, oh, you know what? This is a master lock made by a master crafts person. This is one of the best locks you've ever seen, which means it's going to be a hard task, right? Absolutely. And then if the language is neutral, it would just mean it's a standard task, right? So you you, the GM could kind of code the wording as long as the players know what those cues are. Right. Um, and yeah, you know, I think after a few sessions, you'll start picking up on that. Maybe even in the first session, fairly easy, especially if the GM explains, you know, I'm going to kind of say, use words like simple, easy, or hard, or difficult, or, you know, exceptional, or rare. Like, and when you hear those kind of languages, you know, add or, mi or add or minus three. Right. 
you know, and th those things would allow you to actually stay more in the narrative and less in the mechanical and could, you know, really intensify the experience or keep the immersion factor high. So some, uh, some fun facts, you know, about this, and this is, you know, kind of written on the back of the book. It's a full blown D20 system tested by thousands worldwide. Uh, it's a do anything fast friendly rule set you've been looking for. Uh, it comes with five full worlds in the master edition. That's fantasy, sci-fi, weird west, ice age, and supers. All the maps, lore, and detail you need to go deep. So there's a lot jam packed into this particular edition of the book. It's easily, you know, carted into like any particular genre that you really want to be able to, to go with. So if you are looking for a game that is a little bit easier to, to swallow, requires less in the way of books and, you know, carting things around, I see RPG or index card RPG certainly deserves your look. Yeah, to me, it very much seems like a game that was designed to be like, okay, you want to play D&D, &D, but you want to spend less time either looking for rules in your book and more time just playing. I think you know, Runehammer came up with some elegant solutions to, to for the flow of the game to make it easier, but then he also made it where it could be a generic system that can be used for multiple genres. I'm fairly certain there is a ton of random roll charts in that book. I think even the standard one has a bunch of random roll charts yes. in it as well. Yeah, th this one has got, you know, pages and pages of those roll charts because we know Runehammer loves his roll charts. Yeah. Uh, you know, but beyond, you know, spending time looking through the book, character creation is super fast, super quick. You only have a a handful of things to, to really check out. So it's a way to get into the game and playing super quick. I, I've seen it firsthand. Did you see it when you, did anyone use magic? So yes, when with this particular system, and I apologize for not calling this out, uh, it's very similar to the way, uh, if you happen to see our Cairn video, uh, this is a, a system that's very similar to that. You have essentially a spell book or an item that, you know, has access to magic. You can just use it. And each magic is associated with a particular stat so you would use that to attempt to succeed or, or not and then you would just use the magic damage so like you know if you're throwing a fireball that's what it does so tell what do you think i see rpg does really well I see RPG is another great game that is rules light, super quick to get into. So if you've got a game that you want to throw together and you're not certain what system it's going to fit into, you can check it out with this. Or you know you want to take a break from your normal game and try something different. The the familiarity enough with D and D because the crossover is so close. I feel this is a great way to get somebody to try other RPGs because it's close enough to D and D, but isn't true. And like maybe you can't run your normal D and D game. Game, and someone else wants to run something and you're like well I don't want to make it real hard for them to learn a new game I don't want to spend hours creating characters I know we pull out ICRPG it's just like D&D &D in a lot of ways and then we can just start playing and you know if you're new to DMing uh, this is a great game to you know test the waters with because as I mentioned with a game like D&D &D, armor classes and saving throws like all of these things change from monster to monster scene to scene whereas in a game like index card RPG you've got a static number unless you feel the need to make it easier or hard and you can just you know kind of run with it so i feel that's a very you know low bar for for dms who want to get in that seat but are afraid of the complexity of dnd I think that's a wrap for our ICRPG. We'll put a link to it down in the description. You guys can go check it out. All right, so what is Nerdarchy working on today? We're going to talk about Zoo Mafia, how to make a boss. So, Ted, what is a boss in Zoo Mafia? So, in Zoo Mafia, your boss is your kingpin, your ruler, you know, your, your creme de la creme of power within your zoo. This is the person who you're trying to either fight against, avoid, or try to impress. So, they're, they're the pinnacle of power in a Zoo Mafia campaign. In Zoo Mafia, bosses kind of donate maybe areas of influence, uh, whether you're talking about a physical domain or location, or different crimes that they happen to be in charge of and want to kind of rule over, and that's their sphere of influence. When, you know, whether you know it is running booze or racketeering or any, any such criminal activities, that's their jam and that's their thing. So if you're first hearing about Zoo Mafia here and you'd love to see all all the other Zoo Mafia conversations. We got a playlist where you can uh, hear us talk about all the fun things right up here. So real quick, let's just give everyone a quick idea of what Zoo Mafia is. It's set in the 1920s, 1930s kind of era at the height of 
prohibition, you know, gambling and alcohol are a no bueno. But, you know, we have the zoo where during the day, all your animals are normal in their enclosure and everything is all hunky dory. But at night, you know, the humans go home and the animal animals get to wake up and live their secret life uh, where, you know, you represent a, a gang, a mob, if you will, where you are trying to play adventurers who want to get made. They want to get into a family of recognized criminals. So you're going to go wild and do crime and not let the humans catch you. Yeah, they they use weapons. They wear they wear human clothes. They do all, they, they talk to each other. They do all the things you would expect people to do. But they're not people. But they're uh, not people. A uh, big part of the game is also making sure that people don't see you doing people stuff. But now we're going to get into the specifics of Zoo Mafia bosses. So the, the great thing about the bosses is, you know, you want them to really feel unique. And, you know, while we have established characters or personas that we have put into, you know, the games that we have played, as this kind of gets out into the wider world and more people begin playing, uh, you know, you get to see, you know, new and new and other creations but each one should be unique there should be something special about them that makes that character stand out from the others so when you look at a at a mob boss or a mafia boss you know you have to say is like all right well what is it about this particular character that i want to attribute a mechanic to and how is that going to play in a game like you know zoo mafia yeah, at, at its core, what we would look at when creating our Zoo Mafia bosses is what is the personality traits of this particular boss? What animal are they? What are their spheres of influence? And how would all of that kind of affect you know, the mechanics and how they play in the game? Uh, Machine Gun Otto is kind of insane and chaotic, right? So his mechanics should reflect that. Like, it should be hard for the players to kind of pin him down and figure out what he's going to do. Where Al Capone is ruthless and efficient right so there should be no wasted movements there should be no wasted energy but she always knows exactly what she's going to do and executed it cutes it where um our carlo hambino boss tends to be more even keel he tends to be above the fray he doesn't like to get his hands dirty so his moves would probably be more about having other people do stuff for him than him personally doing stuff now i've also introduced uh, uh don pigeon as one of the you know one of the one of the pigeon park mafia crime boss and one of their big things was actually having other critters end up taking the damage for him. So he had damage mitigation because, you know, he rules over a vast number of animals, but they're small and inconsequential compared to, you know, uh, maybe a, a warthog or a rhino or something. So like their, their thing is, you know, also organizing, using others and also having others sacrifice for them. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of the mob boss, th this is someone who has attained enough status that there should be a level of fear in in dealing with them because they have at their disposal a network of hired killers and thugs and goons doing all number of things it's not just one person running one particular racket or a couple of different rackets you know you've got a pyramid scheme going on and the power you know all leads up so if you don't have the ability to like set that that into motion then you're probably not dealing with a mafia boss yet you're probably dealing with one of those underlings exactly uh but you know you can like we said there's a playlist you can check out all the things that we have going on with zoo mafia you can even download the fr the free quick start rules as well as the form fillable pdfs over on nerdarchy.com we'll put links down in the description for you to check it out now you can also check out zoomafiarpg.com sign up for the newsletter so that you can stay apprised of all of the different updates as well as information when we launch this on kickstarter all right, folks, we've got one more topic to get through today. So today we're talking about Into the Wormhole, Vast Grim RPG from our own table. Uh, you know, let's, let's get into it. First of all, you know, Into the Wormhole is a game we're currently running over on the channel. We're doing live streams of it, live plays of it. The intent is to do, I believe we're doing 12 sessions of it. We even have, we have the creator, Brian Colon, involved in the stream and the game. And as well as Sonic Knight, Carlos Rivero is our GM and running the game for us. We are two sessions deep into the game as of us recording this. And, you know, we're having a lot of fun with it. So um, what can we tell people about Into the Wormhole? All right, well, 
I think we need to rewind first. First and foremost, Vaskrim is a sci-fi RPG, which is a hack of Morkborg written by Brian Colon, great friend of the channel. Morkborg and Vaskrim are both a game where doom is already approaching, you know, whether it be the world, whether it be the universe. So you play a game where you tend to be just survivors. You're looking to just keep alive, keep afloat, keep moving for yet another day. In our particular game, rewinding to your question, we're actually taking... Well, real quick, I would say, if you go to the card up here, you can find Nardaki plays other RPGs of Vast Grimm. So if you want more information about the specific game, because now we're just going to get into the gameplay and what's going on at our table. But if we were rewind to answer your, your question, you know, what can we talk about with Wormhole? We are rewinding the timeline. In Vast Grimm, we have the, you know, these these worms, these these creatures that can like crawl into you and turn you into the Grimm, you know, zombie-esque, you know. They're like death. hive mind zombies, yeah. right? They're not true zombies because I think uh, Vast Grimm actually has its own version of an astro zombie. Right. But they're more like a hive mind collective that, they, you know, once you turn to the Grimm, you, once you get infected by a worm and you succumb, you become the Grimm and they're, the, you know, it's basically the, like we are Legion, we are the Grimm, right. which is weird because the, 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 the adventurers are called your Legion. Yeah. So. <laughs> and that term comes from the fact that in the early wars against the worms and the Grimm, they were called legions. And like, so it's kind of like a fragment of what's left over. Because when the game, you know, when the game happens, it's like, oh, everything is all already gone to hell. Everything's gone to shit. There is no, there isn't any really good guys left. Everyone's just fighting for survival. But like you said, we're rewinding to when the Grimm, when the, the worms are just first discovered. So we, we are playing a game where we exist in a normal universe. The, sh the universe is not gone to pot. We, we, we have not discovered the worms and what have you as of session one. Uh... I'm not going to give any particular spoilers just yet, but if you are not following along and you want to hear, you know, the things in, in, in detail, then you might want to, you know, pause this video, go watch what we've done so far, and come on back after the fact. But now there are spoilers. In the game, we are going to discover or have discovered, you know, these worms that have affected individuals. And it's a, a situation where it is entirely possible that our characters are the ones that are going to be responsible for the, the distribution of the end of the universe, the, you know, the Grimm. Yeah, so we start off working for a corporation. What is it? Galactic? Galactic uh, Research Institute for Mysterious Materials. Yes. So it's grim. Grim, or, right? Or, 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 or. Uh, my character is a th is called a man the basically there's like character classes. Mm -hmm. I'm playing Lefty Lawson. He is a manchin. Uh, manchins are basically cyborgs, and I, and basically I worked for this organization, this corporation. I got gravely injured in a mining accident, so Doctor Frankenstone, <laughs> uh, you know, cobbled me back together with a bunch of mining equipment. But unfortunately, the corporation Grim that we work for is like mm, we spent a lot of money and resources in saving your life so you actually have a balance sheet and you owe us so my character is kind of indentured servant you have to work off your debt and unfortunately through doing things any 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 medical equipment or any medical costs in your you know in your endeavor get added to your bill so you are almost always accruing more debt than you are actually taking off Yes. Uh, so, and then we have an emo bot, mm -hmm. Mara, that is kind of in the same circumstances. They're like, "Well, we made you, and yo, know, you're sentient, so we can't own people. That would be wrong. But it was really expensive to make you, so you just have to work that off, and then you're free to go on your way." So, uh, Mara and you know Lefty, you know, they have this whole thing where they, you know, they they have this camaraderie over this indentured servitude about nonsense. hating our overlords, our corporate overlords, <laughs> which is amusing because I, on the other hand, a completely, you know, I don't want to say normal human because my character is certainly more left of center. Uh, I'm playing Flask. He's a twisted biochemist uh, and he wholeheartedly works for this, this grim organization. I have certainly scarred and marred myself a number of times through my own experimentation. Uh, and because the organization is looking for mysterious materials, anytime I'm like on site, you know, if there's something that I'm unfamiliar with, all right, well, I have to take a sample of it. So I've yeah. got, got a whole bunch of empty, well, flasks that I can then, you know, put stuff in. And as we're exploring this, you know, weird planet and 
people are blowing their heads off. Uh, it's like, oh, well, I need to take a sample of that. I need to take a sample of that. And while Ted's normal process for characters is like, I need to be concerned with, you know, saving my own ass. Uh, this is, this I think is the, the, the first game that's a campaign where I am like completely bought into the, any move I am making. It could very well possibly be, this could be the end of my character, could be the end of our Legion, it could be, you know, the end of the universe, but I am here for it. My character... Because your character's kind of unstable, so they're not <laughs> really... They're more concerned with their research than the self-preservation. Now, as a twisted biochemist, like, your special ability is to create these mixtures mm -hmm. that you can inject with people yes. throughout the day. Every day you get to make new ones. Mm -hmm. My character's thing is being um, part mechanical, and I can actually tie into machines specifically, uh, start ships which makes me better at piloting them better at piloting them <laughs> but since it's based on die rolls i suck at rolling dice not so great and then mara is uh, emo bot which means the robotics so they have you know basically machine type abilities i'm not sure what her with what their suite of abilities are mm -hmm. Uh, but we also have, you know, Buckaroo, uh, who's, you know, pure bot. I don't know what... He's a, he's a offshoot from the emo bot. It's like an expansion that came out for Vaskrim. But he's also a clown. Basically, he's <laughs> a clown on tank treads and a robot. And he fights using... Uh, his special ability is to make clown animals... <laughs> that do specific things. It's not really too far off from what the Twisted Biochemist does, mm -hmm. but instead of using things to be injected into your allies or enemies, they're making... The enemies worse? Well, I, I'm not sure if all their abilities, if they have, are, are Banes and they might have some buffs, but it all involves using balloon animals. And that's Buckaroo. And then finally we have Skylar. S Skylar, who is a technomaniac. Yeah. Uh, so it's another one where there's like, you know, not quite cyborg, but, you know, in between a cyborg and a human. So they use a lot of technological interfaces. Like, well, I, they explain things as nano, nanobots. Uh, okay. I was pretty sure, like, one of their arms was entirely cyborg. It's a gauntlet. Oh, is it a gauntlet? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We've only had two sessions and you know what have you so we're still learning you know our characters and abilities yeah. and truth be told we haven't had a whole ton of combat so uh yeah. some things has just been some awesome role playing and definitely some exposition and learning uh, uh learning what's going on in the world yeah a lot of it's learning with the world we've all played vast grim before so we have an understanding of the game it's a d20 system it's basically osr D, &D so it's very easy it's very non-complicated -com uh the sessions we're running are about two hours long so if you wanted to go check that out you could could as we and you know explore the world that Carlos is creating for us alongside of us. It's a lot of fun. We're enjoying it. Uh, maybe we'll do some more updates about the the gameplay and, and where things have gone with our characters, or, or at least the very end. We'll talk about the who end of the campaign. Who, yeah, who, who survived, survived and who hasn't? Because yeah. uh, you know, as we know, this is a very brutal s game. I've already got two backup characters, uh, you know, prepped and ready to go. Uh, and you know, if you follow along with our online games, you know that we tend to do character art thanks to uh, you know the wonderful Stephen Parcher who does our art for that uh, and he's already got art for my you know my, my first backup character so it's uh, you're the only one that has done that homework I think <laughs> uh, well you know I I try to you know whatever uh, it is what it is uh, but I got I got my my backup character ready because uh, I really do not think flask is gonna make it so we'll see what happens you, you never know so if you have any comments uh, about this topic or any other topic feel free to leave them down in the description below let us know what you think share with the nerdarchy community while you're down there, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, do all those things that make the YouTube happy. Remember, we drop regular videos here on the channel, so come on back. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.